Terrificon is back. The Terrific Comic Con, devoted to, what else? Comic books and their creators, returns to Mohegan Sun Expo Center in Connecticut. The three-day event features the largest gathering of comic book writers and artists. The largest of its kind in New England is on August 9th through the 11th. Terrific Con producer Mitch Halleck promises this year's event will be the best con he's ever produced with today's top talent, like Tom King, Donnie Cates, Ryan Stegman, Clay Mann, Liam Sharp, Derek Robertson, plus legendary creators Jim Steranko, Chris Claremont, Jim Starlin, Jerry Ordway, and in his final con appearance, the one and only George Perez. Terrificon will be celebrating Batman's anniversary, as well as featuring actors from the Bat films, Billy D. Williams, Robert Wool, and Val Kilmer, plus Doctor Who's John Barrowman, The Flash's John Wesley Shipp, the voice cast reunion of Animaniacs and Pinky and the Brain and lots more. See for yourself why Terrificon is summer's hottest Comic Con this August 9th through the 11th only at Mohegan Sun. For more information and guest list, visit Terrificon.com. It's terrific! Hey everybody, welcome to the Memorial Day weekend on Word Balloon. I hope everyone uh, has a very uh, nice first uh, summer holiday weekend. This is John Sutras, really excited about today's episode. Eric Carrasco. You might know Eric's name if you uh, follow your credits on uh, various television shows and film and animation. Eric uh, was on the Justice League action crew. He also just recently wrote the Justice League vs. the Fatal Five animated movie that uh, featured our pal the animated Amazon herself, Susan Eisenberg as Wonder Woman and also Kevin Conroy as Batman and George Newbern as Superman. Great stuff, great cast. Uh, They of course uh, led a a bunch of newcomers with the Justice League in uh, the Justice League vs. Fatal Five. Eric tells us about uh, his character choices for the movie and uh, how he set it up and uh, a lot of good insight into uh, the inclusion of uh, of course Starboy, Tom Collar and uh, uh, the uh, Legion and uh, their appearances in the movie and of course the Fatal Five and then for the last three seasons Eric has been part of the Supergirl television series which is great because truly I think uh, each season the show just keeps getting better and season four just wrapped up uh, the previous Sunday uh, I thought it was excellent I really enjoyed the places that it went to we got Lex Luthor and a great Lex Luthor and John Cryer who would have thought Fantastic Lex Luthor, and uh, you know, just advancements in all the characters, and, and uh, really interesting stories, and groundbreaking television as well. With our first uh, trans uh, superhero character in Dreamer, really neat stuff. And uh, we talk all about that with Eric as uh, he wraps up his time on Supergirl. So lots of interesting insight in the Supergirl's writer room with Eric Carrasco, uh, and again, talking a lot about the animation and more on this conversation today on Word Balloon. I think you're going to enjoy it. As always, Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you, League, for your continued support via Patreon. Word Balloon is free, but if you want to subscribe and help the cause out here, I greatly appreciate it. Go to patreon.com slash wordballoon, or you can click on the Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. But uh, you are literally uh, being the producers of Word Balloon and uh, helping me out. Uh, thank you very much for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. It's also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, the industry's fastest growing independent publishing company, calling 2019 the year of reading dangerously. I talk about Aftershock books because they're our sponsor, but they make some great books, man. I'm telling you, this week, look out for Killer Groove, the L.A. crime story from Ali Masters and Owen Marin. Really neat stuff. Uh, a nice companion to what Ollie did on uh, The Kitchen, the great Vertigo series he did with Ming Doyle a couple of years ago. But uh, that debuts uh, this coming Wednesday, May 29th. You'll definitely want to check it out. This month also dropped Descendant from Stephanie Phillips, a great historic conspiracy theory that uh, starts to unravel kind of uh, National Treasure meets the X Files, is a good way to describe uh, the ideas behind Descendant mixing history with a very interesting conspiracy theory. There's Oberon, a new supernatural series from Ryan Parrott. 
Dark Red from my buddy Tim Seeley, Stronghold from my buddies Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly, and also great things like Animosity from Marguerite Bennett, and A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis, Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn, my buddy, and Juan Doe, and Baby Teeth from Donny Cates. Aftershock continues to push the envelope this year with new releases and ongoing series that will continue to thrill, chill, and challenge imaginations and sensibilities. Now, in the weeks ahead, we'll have more talks with some more Aftershock creators about their books, but you don't have to wait. Check out full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. All right, without further ado, let's get into our conversation now with Eric Carrasco talking about Supergirl, Justice League, and the Fatal Five, DC Animation, and a whole lot more on today's Word Balloon. Eric Carrasco, welcome to Word Balloon. It's a pleasure to meet you, man. Hey, John, how you doing? Doing good, man, and uh, congratulations on uh, the writing career so far. Some uh, big uh, moments on the resume that uh, lasted for a while. Yeah, two seasons on Supergirl, is that correct? Uh, three seasons. Three nice seasons going. on Supergirl. Wow. Yeah. Excellent, yeah. man. Holy cow, that's fantastic. And you're, and I know you wrote several episodes, but you're also a story editor. So, like, you know, what, what, did, you know, what happens in the writing room as a story editor? You know, it's kind of weird in live action TV. I, I can't. I came from cartoons first. Okay. And in, in animation, story editor is a title that actually means something. You kind of do edit the story, and you are kind of in charge of making sure when the freelance scripts come in, they're they're matching the voice of the show and stuff. In live action, the title is sort of just a, a bump from staff writer. It is mostly just a title you there's obviously more expected of you as you move up the ladder in television but for the most part story editor is is much less meaningful uh in live action uh so but it's kind of interesting because it makes your imdb whatever year you're a story editor and an executive story editor somehow you just have suddenly you have 22 credits a season uh under your writing resume and i i always find that very interesting but uh but yeah we, we did a lot of work on the show for for three years uh which just came to a close with uh the season four finale last night yeah pretty good man uh great season and uh really i've enjoyed really from the start how uh supergirl has been able to weave in elements of the superman mythos uh you know and making them her stories and you know, I don't. I, I I'm not a nitpicker where you know how dare you or anything like that at all. And honestly, it, I think it affords uh, all of you the opportunity to take an established idea like Red Son turning it into Red Daughter uh, this year, and uh, you know, adding a few different elements to it, and it, and it, and it makes for a different story. It's sort of um, – yeah, it's sort of a weird, especially coming in. Uh, you know, I was hired to sort of be the comic book person on oh, this great and was hired as a as a fan um and so it's it's very weird for me to come in you know knowing the stories really well and really deeply caring about them and also knowing at the same time that the stuff is going to change um and you're going to have to like fuss with parts of the mythos and you know the very nature of the show means that you're and what they set out to do was already different than the Kara of the comics. You know, we didn't have Linda Lee. We didn't have some of the alter egos. And sure. she didn't come from the Midvale Orphanage. So there were already lots of differences uh, coming in. But I think if you have that kind of baseline knowledge in the writer's room, it can sort of just help to figure out, you know, what the rules are so that you can break them, that sort of thing. Well, I like the fact that really even in season two, when they first introduced Superman to the show – I, I would laugh at some of the blogs that I read. We're like, well, he's going to take over the focus. He has to. He's Superman. And it's like, guys and women who say that, um, it's kind of like, you know, when uh, Green Arrow is going to fight Solomon Grundy in Green <laughs> Arrow, the issue of Green Arrow, who do you think's going to win? It's going to be Green Arrow. And it's like, the show's still called Supergirl. And honestly, I, I think you guys did a great job, and women, that uh, uh, putting out there um, a Supergirl that is formidable despite the existence of her cousin. And I think, you know, you really got a teamwork feeling on the TV show as opposed to the older hero mentor and, and uh, mentee student uh, kind of relationship in the comics. Yeah, our Superman was a lot more brotherly. Like, you know, there's yeah. the, the, the Silver Age Superman that is everybody's dad is not really what we were going for, <laughs> although I love that Superman, sure. right? I love the, the, the Kurt Swan PSA Superman is, you know, kind of where my heart is. But That's I hilarious. think that there's, you know, there's something that runs through the Supergirl comics that, that makes her not just 
you know, a girl version of Superman, which it's so she so easily could have been. Absolutely. And, and just the mere fact that she came to Earth when she was already so much older than Kal El was gives her that extra pathos. It means she knows so much more about Krypton to begin with. Uh, she had a responsibility, and instead of having to find her Earth mission, at least the way we did her in the show, you know, she had that mission of I'm going to protect infant Kal El that she could never fulfill when she got here. So unlike Clark, who has to kind of find his way, she she came knowing her purpose. And she's just uh, she's so interesting to me in so many ways, and she always uh, was from you know the the Sterling Gates Jamal Eagle comics, uh, and then the New Fifty Two Supergirl. Uh, you know, some people's mileage varies on New Fifty Two, but I thought Supergirl was one of their strongest titles, and I loved what they did with kind of this like psychological realism with her. And so to get to play with that was a uh, was really really fun. That's cool. You know, and again, I, I kind of leaned on this season looking at your credits, and I want to get to that. But even in, in seasons two and three when you started, what were some of your scripts? We uh, So so I came in um, and I did the, – the very first one I did was a, a very Martian Manhunter-focused one, cool. and it introduced Miss Martian to the show. Oh, that's uh, great. Sure. Absolutely. Again, yeah. absolutely. That's excellent. And so you'll notice a kind of a trend where I also then did my damnedest to introduce her into the DC animated universe on Justice League versus the Fatal Five. I love that character. Absolutely. Uh, great character. No, I but, completely uh, agree. That's maybe the most cognitive dissonance I ever had as a comic book fan because uh, <laughs> it was decided that, that uh, she would be uh, ultimately a love interest for Jean. Mm-hmm. Um and so that is a very different relationship than the one they have in the comics, which is a, a niece uncle relationship. Um, and so that was kind of uh, weird for me. But, we, you know, we had this kind of lovely episode that introduced her and was all about the tragedy of Mars. Um, and then I got to do uh, maybe the most fun uh episode I ever got to take part in, uh, which was Supergirl Lives. Uh, it was a, an episode that Kevin Smith directed. And so we kind of had fun doing kind of a, a Star Trek away team episode uh, where Supergirl went to space. Uh, and that was that was a, a just so much fun. Well, you know, this year, uh, what's so funny about Truth, Justice in the American Way, a Joe K- Casey classic that, uh, again, yes. S- Supergirl puts her own spin on it. And also the introduction of the elite in Manchester Black. Uh, again, because it's Supergirl instead of Superman, it becomes different. And I love the casting. Uh, I, I thought that they were all excellent. And the guy who played uh, Manchester Black was fantastic. Yeah, uh, David Ajala. He is, uh, he is so, so gifted and such a joy on set. But he's like, he's unbelievable because he'll give you, he'll give you all those variations and levels that you're looking for. And he'll do one, you know, really big take. And then one where it's something so subtle and like, he just gives you so much to work with. It's, uh, it's those classically trained, uh, British actors. I'm a sucker for, uh, Bruce Boxleitner every, every time he shows up, whether he's a hero or a villain. And, I know, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a Babylon five guy. So, uh, you know, Captain Sheridan, he's, I'm, I'm a big fan. And I thought he was, he was terrific as, uh, the uh, double dealing president. I played it very cool with him for a very long time <laughs> on set with him. But I'm not going to ask him about Tron. I'm not going to ask of him. Of course. About, yes, he like, is Tron. I'm going to ask about them all the time. And then, you know, we were actually, we were flying back from Vancouver and he was sitting in the seat next to me and, you know, we were, we were chit chatting and he goes, so Tron, and he just could tell, you know, he was like, he took one look at me and he was like, I know you want to know this. I know you want to know <laughs> where we're at with any potential Tron sequels. Like, I know, I know you, I, I see it in your eyes. He just knows. Like, so he'll tell you. That's excellent. You know, and honestly, I always forget that he was Tron and it's like, holy shit, of course he was Tron. Cause he is, he was the- so, you know, for me, it's Captain Sheridan. And even, I'll even cop to Scarecrow and Mrs. King. Back in the day, in the eighties, yeah. I'm that old, and, and again, I he's you can't help but love the guy. I love his westerns as well. I mean, he's he's a great actor. He's great, man. And you know, it, it was one of just talking about Tron. It was one of the the missed opportunities I had. I kept wanting to have uh, the president in our show say that he fights for the voters, but I couldn't. Uh, I could never <laughs> make it in. <laughs> he's. He's of course yes part of the uh, the the Tron coalition. That's fantastic. That's uh, excellent, man. <laughs> Too damn funny. Uh, yeah, 
you know who was uh, amazing? Sorry, just to Tell circle me, back to, yeah. the, uh, uh, to the Truth Justice episode. Uh, Joe Casey was great because I, I, I DM'd him on Twitter when I knew uh, that we were bringing Manchester Black onto the show. That was He was also introduced in one of my episodes. And, I, you know, I wanted to do right by Joe and by that comic book because cool. I really care about it. And so I sort of reached out to him and was like, listen, he's not going to have – the uh, the telekinetic powers, but uh, I think he's he's going to be pretty faithful, and we're doing something really interesting. And you got to you know we lucked out with the actor playing him, and he was just very cool about it and very you know open you know hit me up with questions. And so when we did uh, when we did that episode, um, uh, I got to like reach out to him and be like, thank you so much for for those issues. Um, it uh, they meant a lot to me. So you know I hope we did uh, him proud. I'm glad to hear that. No, he's a good guy, and uh, those men of action guys. I got a lot of respect for them, what they've been able to accomplish both uh, when they're working for DC or Marvel and then when they're doing their own thing as well. For sure, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. Uh, Well, let's even uh, circle back to to working with Kevin Smith. What was that like? Oh, he's the greatest. Um, he, I, you know, some of these stories are, are are legend now of working on set with Kevin Smith from from different things, but at least um, on the superhero shows because he's done episodes of flash and he's done episodes of supergirl and you know it they're very hard shows and week in week out these crews are working you know hard hours and making little movies every week um and you know we we gotta make a girl fly and 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 shoot heat vision and you know there's a lot going on it's a very demanding and so it can get you know quiet on set and it can get a little rough uh and kevin comes in and he loves this stuff so much. He knows the world so well that he comes in and he just makes set so much fun. Cool. You clap after really good takes. And you don't just clap for, you know, a good performance, a good take from an actor. It'll be like, let's hear it for Dolly Grip Alex. And everybody claps. And, you know, <laughs> he's constantly pointing out, like, look, look how lucky we are to get to do this. Like, we're making movies. We're making magic people. And, you know, it's, a, it's fun to be around. Uh, and he'll, you know... There's kind of a, a line uh, in the sand between TV writers and TV directors, and people don't want to get in each other's soup too much for the sure. most part. Yeah. We don't want to direct the episode for them, and they don't tend to uh, you know, write anything into the show the way they could on maybe a feature. Yes. Um, but Kevin will just, you know, he'll throw it out there. If he's if he's if he's got an idea. There was one episode where uh Lena Luther is, you know, talking to James Olsen on our show, and he goes by James on the show. Right, right. And, you know, we, we had this line that was such a missed opportunity where James just says to Lena, you know, uh, uh, my friends call me James um, instead of Mr. Olsen. And Kevin was just like, oh, he should just be like, my friends call me James or Jimmy. And it was just that little thing that showed that, you know, Kevin was a fan first and was thinking about this as you know what would i want to see on this show just watching it as a fan and i was like oh i can't believe i didn't think to do that let's let's toss it in there let's have her say that and having a director who can do that is uh is is such a gift now i missed that one so did lana say or jimmy or did uh did james say jimmy oh he yeah there she keeps calling him mr olsen throughout the episode right. they they kind of have like a, a cold spell between them uh where they're they're you know obviously her brother has kidnapped uh, Jimmy right. a bunch of times, has right. kidnapped James. Uh, <laughs> and so he doesn't necessarily trust Luthor's as a rule. Uh, and so they keep calling each other Mr. Olsen, Miss Luther. And uh, at the end, Kevin kind of threw that line where, where James was just like, you know, call me James. Or oh, that's Jimmy. cool. Okay, I'm with uh, you. Wow. And so for a while, she was the only person who called him Jimmy Olsen besides right. Clark when he came to the right. show. Which, was- which, which I always love. That's the great joke is that he's almost embarrassed. Like, yeah, he calls me Jimmy. And it's just like, you know, and it's also, I just love the casting that he's so gigantic and stuff. And it's like, yeah, that's not Jimmy Olsen. That is James Olsen. And I love the difference. I absolutely love, I love the difference. It is a fun, and I think they must be playing with it in that new, you know, the the new Matt Fraction, uh, Steve Lieber, Jimmy Olsen. They must be playing with it a little bit that like, you know, they also did it in All-Star Superman where it's like, on some level, as dopey as Jimmy Olsen is, he is Superman's pal for a reason. The coolest man in the world thinks Jimmy is really cool, and he's gotten into all these crazy, insane adventures and been turned into a turtle and shit. And I just feel like uh, <laughs> that's a that's a cool guy. He might wear a bow tie, but that guy's cool. Well, you know, I sadly I, again showing my age. I remember in the in the seventies, in the in the late seventies, uh, during the Superman family run. 
where it was basically what everyone wants from Lois now. And then they wanted it then as well. But when, when Jimmy was Mr. Action, and he basically was just investigative yeah. reporter Jimmy. And they were great. Yeah. They were plain clothes action comics. And and it was fine. And Jimmy was very capable. And, and they kind of, I thought, you know, adopted a good, more modern tone. And I love the Silver Age stuff. All the crazy things that Moore Weisinger and company had Jimmy do back in the, you know, from the 50s through the 70s. But Jimmy was great. And I, and I was a huge fan of those... Supergirl, Superman family uh, story. So, yeah, I'm kind of, uh, and again, I, I love the graduation too. To well, you know where he is now on Supergirl. I think it's, I think it's terrific. I, ca- I got to be honest, I wasn't sure about him being Guardian because I'm a big believer in, uh, and then, and I think that Supergirl does have its share of civilian characters. I just always think that you know a hero needs a bunch of civilians around them for different voices and a different, you know, to have a different point of view. That's why it looks like you know you never want Foggy Nelson to put a costume on. Yeah, it works. It works you know. particularly well in the, the the Superman family comics to have lots of civilians around, and exactly. I, I think that's one of the one of the better things about the Superman cast has been that you you always have Perry White, and you always have you know these different characters that never seem to you know get too involved in the superhero action or when they do, it is always in their role as a journalist or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, I would tend to agree. I think we we told some good Guardian stories, but we we didn't. Um, I'm not sure we did enough of them to really like establish him as like a full fledged force on the show. And you know, it, it, you know, want you know, didn't want the show to turn into Arrow too right, much, right? Um, or kind of had vigilantes on motorcycles, and so there was a push pull of that. And so uh, we did some some very different stuff with him in in season four. Um, where he got to kind of stretch a little bit and do some different stuff. Um, but yeah, the, the, the most fun thing for me was when we introduced Lex Luthor getting to show you James through that prism, uh, because for a while only Clark called him Jimmy, then Lena called him Jimmy. And then you realize, Oh, the whole Luthor family calls him Jimmy and Lex just refuses to call him anything else. And I, I thought that was a lot of fun. Absolutely. We had him testify against Lex at his trial and stuff like that. And it was just like a, you know, Makad, the, the actor who, who plays James on the show, came up to me and afterwards he was like, you know what? We did this trial scene. And it was me and Lena testifying against Lex Luthor at the trial of the century. And it just felt like some Jack Kirby stuff. Like it just felt like, and I was like, this is very cool. It, it was in Metropolis. And as much as I am such a fan of, of National City and doing Supergirl specific stories, there is that that extra little punch you get out of seeing Metropolis, uh, you know, courthouse written on the windows and stuff. It's just oh, fun. Yeah, the final the final episode where uh, Supergirl and Lex are fighting and she knocks him into the Daily Planet and everything. That's yeah. no, you're right. It's absolutely iconic. So it's Mashad. Is that how you say? His, give me his full name. Uh, Makad Brooks. Makad Brooks. Thank you. Because yeah, I, I, as I just uh, mangled his name. No, he's fantastic and has been since day one. And I, and I really uh, appreciated that. And I'm really, obviously, hats off to John Cryer. And uh, good Lord, man, uh, congratulations, John, for erasing uh, Lenny Luther from our, uh, uh, you know, collective memories. And, and instead, you can really get a Lex that you bought from the first moment you saw him on camera. It was great performance throughout the season. I think, yeah, I, I, he said this a bunch in interviews, but that's literally the reason he did it yeah. was, uh, you know, he's he's uh, such a comic book fan and loves this stuff so much. And I do try to imagine, you know, being him, loving this stuff, loving the Donner Superman and coming in and going, OK, you know, Chris Reeve came up with this story. And my first scene is with Gene Hackman and Chris Reeve. And right. we're going to do all of this cool stuff. This is the best job ever. And this is going to be such an iconic character. And I'm so lucky to be here. And just watching it kind of come down around your ears is uh, it must have been brutal. So he uh, he was truly trying to erase it. Um and uh, I think he, I think he did. I, I'm, I'm very biased, but I'm, I'm glad that we got to, in only three episodes, bring what I thought was some really interesting stuff. To was him. it really only three episodes? Yeah, he did. He did one episode, uh, the the fifteenth episode this season. Right. I think it's called Oh Brother Where Art Thou that introduced him, and it was sort of like a B story in the episode. There's other stuff going on. There's yeah. a big Manchester Black story in that episode. Yeah. But he has all this wonderful stuff with Lena, and then we did one episode. Um, that that I got to co-write 
um, with Dana Horgan, who is amazing. Um, and it was called House of L, and it was sort of the what if we just did a lost episode that was all about, uh, you know, the flashback showing you how Lex got here and what was he doing during these three seasons of Supergirl uh, where he was in prison and, and yeah. stuff like that. How was he pulling the strings? So we did that one and then he was in the finale and that's it. Uh, that's the time he had to make his mark. And I, I am seeing all of these things on Twitter and stuff where they're like, hey, you're, you know, you're up there with Tom Cavanaugh and stuff as our, our favorite uh, Arrowverse villains. And I, I think that's such a testament to, to John and to uh, Melissa, because, you know, she had, you know, most of his scenes, uh, with him because sure. she was playing the, the Big red girl. daughter version of Supergirl. Oh, yes, and so it was of just course. Yes. so many scenes with John and they were, we lucked out. They were amazing together, uh, and had so much chemistry and it was, uh, it was very, very fun to watch. And that was the red daughter idea was fun too, because it almost had that son of Luther, um, matrix, Supergirl feel to Red Daughter. You know, I mean, there was that kind of syncophantic at first before she knew, you know, what she was dealing with, where it, I mean, not as, not as, uh, in love with Lex, but just it, it seemed like that was, that it was leaning towards that. I don't know if that was apparent, especially as yourself as a comic book reader. Oh, very. John Byrne Supergirl. Very much so. We were, um, I, you know, the, the John Byrne stuff is what I, grew up with. Okay. I, start, I started reading Superman comics in earnest uh, when a, a lot of people around my age did, which is Death of Superman. Sure. But that Superman that you were reading at that time was the, the continuation of the, the John Byrne stuff. So when you went back to read trades or you picked up, uh, you know, comics to kind of fill in those blanks, what, what are they referencing? And, you know, where does all this Cadmus stuff come from? And what is Lex's backstory? You go back to that John Byrne stuff. And so, you know, that was my Superman for a very long time. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it was, it was kind of in doing red daughter, we were, yes, going, you know, it was our homage to the red sun comic book, sure. but it was also sort of the, what we thought was kind of the er version of alternate Supergirls. It was, you know, sort of matrix Supergirl, sort of red sun, Superman, you know, sort of, there's some Silver Age alternate Supergirl stories, um, and it was just sort of our kind of chance to play with all of that and and combine. You know, there was the the Jeff Loeb uh, Supergirl comics um, with I think Michael Turner was drawing it at that point, oh, yeah. um, where there were two versions of Supergirl, and so you know there was a lot of. Uh, a lot of fun stuff to play with and we sort of just wanted to do our own thing. We can get accused sometimes of uh, just filing the serial numbers off of Superman stories and uh, turning them into Supergirl stories. <laughs> Truly, we were not doing just Red Sun. We were taking you know, a piece of that concept and, and uh, doing something, I hope, a little different with it. Absolutely, man. No, and I think, again, no, I think I, you have to... Well, first of all, there's... It's funny, I, I, my friend Rob Meyer Burnett, who does a lot of uh, YouTubing and uh, does a lot of podcasts and stuff, and the whole talk about Star Wars and, and, and Star Trek, and it's like, especially regarding, well, both Star Wars and Star Trek, he's like, you know, there's so many good comic books and, and novels that both Lucas and, um, you know, uh, Star Trek should delve into for possible storylines, and there's nothing wrong with that, and also, again, I do think you guys do make them different. But why not take from this source material? It's great, and it doesn't negate what's come before, and leaves it open for whatever movies you know might be decided by the you know DC cinematic universe down the line. Um, but yeah, have fun and tell your stories. I mean, that's good, good lord. The entire era voice, the, the entire era verse is like that, and it's yeah. it's a it's a blast. It's great, and most I, I think most of us. I can I'm sure there's enough vocal fans out there that are saying that, you know, with that kind of frustration. But it's a trip. It's fun. That's what makes it fun is it's recognizable enough, but different enough that you're like, oh, look at what they did. Look at the left turn they made. Oh, yeah. And we can look. We can we we pulled from, you know, Rain, our season three villain yeah. was a New 52 Supergirl story. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've done a, a, our fair share of actual Supergirl stories and dealt with her parents and dealt with her specific world. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, iconic Superman stories that we get to mind. So we get uh, kind of the best of both worlds there. Um, and, you know, it, it is uh, – I kept pitching Jero the Merboy, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's a little harder to do on the CW some of the uh, the older Supergirl adventures, um, but uh, uh, I liked to. <laughs> Drags where I could. I'm glad. I'm glad Brainiac has uh, become a, a semi regular and everything. I think that's terrific. It, it, it is so much fun. I think uh, you know every writer has like favorite characters to write, and you know for a long time mine was uh, Supergirl's sister Alex. Sure. Uh, but there is something about bringing in, particularly you know a few seasons into a show, bringing in a voicier character like you know when they introduced Anya on Buffy uh, and and really brought her into the Scooby Gang, <laughs> you get like a cartoon character to play with on your show. And it is just, it, it just injects every scene he's in with something special. Um, and I'm a, a big Legion fan. So, uh, it was, uh, it was very easy to, to bring him in and, uh, very exciting to get to, to do that. That was one of my, uh, season three episodes was the Legion of superheroes episode, uh, that I co-wrote with Derek Simon. And, uh, it was, we knew when Jesse Rath came in and auditioned for the part, uh, that it was him like immediately because every every actor who came in gave a wonderful performance that was actually ripped from uh, our brain exactly what we imagined when we were writing the sides for the role and Jesse came in and did something entirely different and didn't just play smart he also played uh, an awareness of how smart he was yes. and uh, a, a little bit of arrogance Absolutely. that I think – and you were like, OK, there's the guy who's cool, who Supergirl, you know, in the comics, he's a love interest. Like he's got to be – Oh, yeah. He's, he's got to be a cool guy. So well, so he – that to it. Swagger. That's funny because actually I always felt – and not in, and I love Brainiac 5 in the comics – but when it came to Supergirl, and I, I thought the, the, the relationship was very interesting, and God, especially post-crisis when she dies, and what Brainiac had to go through and yeah. everything. But I also kind of felt it was like when Bradley Cooper used to be on Alias, and that he, <laughs> and that he pined for uh, Supergirl the way that uh, Bradley Cooper pined for Sydney and everything. And it's, yeah. you know, again, it's like, and it's so funny how Cooper has... You know, become such a leading man coming off of that role and everything. But no, I agree with you. I, I like the snide attitude of of Brainy, and I and I like the way that uh, he's played. And God, man, I mean, really, since the introduction of Monel, it's just been great seeing the Legion. And also, we will get to Fatal Five, and I loved uh, the Legion interludes that we were in uh, in the animated movie as well. But uh, before, oh, I, I got to ask about Dreamer as well uh, because. There's a groundbreaking character, and uh, that's cool. Yeah. Now, is she the template for Dreamer? It didn't come from the New Gods. You, were, you guys weren't thinking beautiful Dreamer, were you? No, it was. Uh, you know, uh, Greg Berlanti had come into the room and you know had a had a talk with us, and we were talking about you know who this character would be, and you know we knew this character would be a, a trans woman. And that she would, you know, become a superhero through the course of, you know, the first half of the season uh, or thereabouts. And so we knew that going in and we were thinking about, you know, power sets for her, you know, what, where can we pull from? And we just kind of very quickly uh, got into the legion of it all. You know, we had Brainiac 5 already uh, established as a series regular. And so to get to pull from that same sandbox sort of made sense. Um, we didn't know they'd be love interests right away. Uh, but when we came in, we were like, okay, what is a way we can do a Legion of Superheroes character without, you know, contradicting anything we've said about the 31st century on the show? And so we, we sort of came up with a, a dreamer as a, a distant ancestor of Dream Girl from the Legion of Superheroes. Okay. And okay. so, so yeah. So Nicole Mayans is playing dreamer. Uh, who who uh, is related uh, across a thousand years to the dream girl that we know from the comics? That's fantastic, and I, you know, God, I, I always think of myself as a, a Legion guy, and I might have missed the episode where they made that direct reference or whatever. Because yeah, I um, I forgot. I'm like, well, she's not Princess Projectra. And there's beautiful dream. I totally forgot about Dream Girl. That's hilarious. There is so, so yeah. So and you know, she Dream Girl's had a, a, a run or two where she's actually uh, dated Brainiac Five. I didn't remember so, that. She had silver hair and like a silver costume, right? Yes. You know, yeah. we obviously weren't going to. She has she has one of the more revealing costumes in the Legion canon. Yes. So we yes, we were not going to pull that for inspiration exactly. 
Uh, but, but we we try to be better than that. I understand. Um, it's like the Ms. Marvel problem versus what, what Kelly yes, Sue exactly. and Dexter did with Captain Marvel. I get it exactly. So we were, but we, so we were, um, we got into it only a little bit last season. When there's a couple times when Brainy will slip and call her Nura instead of Nia Nal, um, of and uh, know, she's like, yeah. he's like, who's Nura? And we just kind of lay it there at the fans' feet to be like. Hey, there's something there. It's a story we haven't told yet, um, but uh, you know, it's it's been it's been implied, but there's never been like a great big monologue about uh, the the connection or anything. She actually, you know, doesn't doesn't know much about her descendant. Okay, and again, I'm not asking for spoilers because, uh, but I love the the way that the episode and the season ended, and interesting that uh, the door to Leviathan has been open, and all the Arrowverse shows are pointing to something yeah. with the uh, with the uh, monitor. Coming back and, and certainly uh, that that final moment with the monitor and Luther's body, uh, clearly a resurrection might be happening or some some sort of uh, thing will happen leading into the crossover. Did you get to work much on the crossovers prior to this? Uh, you know, I got to work uh, the the season three crossover uh, uh, Crisis on Earth X. Cool. Uh, I got to uh, I I got to write a, the 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 church fight in it. I, I did oh, nothing awesome. else. I just wrote. I just wrote the church fight at Barry Allen's wedding yeah. uh, where they all burst in and it is uh, – a Larry Tang directed the hell out of it because it was such an – I mean there were like 25 speaking characters yeah. in it and they built that church. <laughs> like we had to destroy it. So at one point I was texting my showrunner and was just like, hey, you know, I'm writing what you guys told me to write but I feel like – you'd have to build the church to do the fight this way. There's gunfire and explosions and, you know, uh, killer frost is flying around shooting icicles at people. I just feel like you're going to have to build this. And they were like, okay, we'll build it. They built that church in addition to the crazy scheduling nightmare that is the crossovers. That is a four show crossover. Uh, they managed to do stuff like let's build a church and let's have this crazy fight happen. And, and Hey, it's television. So you have a day and a half to shoot it. Um, and they did kind of unbelievable work on it. So I got to help more on that one. Uh, not so much this last one, uh, you know, which we all kind of pitched ideas on, but uh, they basically broke that into its own separate room where okay. some of the writers, each of the shows went and basically disappeared for a month just to come up with Interesting. that story. Because it was very intricate. You know, the crossovers are very intricately plotted. Yeah. They get a little bit teen. And so you basically just have to shut down and let that happen on its own and uh, and and hope for the best. Um, but, uh, I, next year is going to be a five way crossover. So that'll yeah. be pretty unprecedented even by the, the Berlanti standards. Holy shit. Yeah. With Batgirl or uh, Batgirl, Char- she, I mean, Batwoman, of course. Uh, yeah. no, that's really cool. That's amazing. I was going to ask earlier when we were talking about Kevin Smith directing, how long does it on average, does it take to film an episode? How many days? Uh, just over, a, just over a week. Wow. Um, like eight days, like, maybe nine. Days. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you get, you have your set schedule, and then you have a, a couple tandem days um, where you're shooting two episodes at the same time, and you just sort of pick up scenes and stuff. Sure, uh, very, uh, very taxing uh, show to make, but our, our our crews are so good at it that at this point that there's you're shocked by the stuff they are capable of doing. No, honestly, the production values are incredible as as far as the end result. They look amazing. And like you were saying as well, that uh, a director might have more of an impact on story in a film because there is that, you know, much more time to sit and think and do things. And I've asked guys like uh, Reggie Hudlin, I've had him on the show, and mm-hmm. comparing his television directing to when he's made features and stuff. So, no, I do. I find it interesting. I also think it's a very uh, special skill. I know uh, reading the uh, behind-the-scenes books of... Things like the Star Trek series and also the uh, Battlestar, the Ron Moore Galactica series. Uh, yeah. You really appreciate a great director that can come in with that kind of pressure and still have some style and and be able to achieve some things that, you know, uh, a run-of-the-mill director who has a different style, you know, isn't able to do. Yeah, there are some things, I mean, you, you definitely notice. Like, yeah. uh, you know, a, a Kevin Smith set is very different than other sets, and, and he'll really think about it in terms of the dialogue and what these what we're saying with this scene and get in there and talk uh intention with you you know he would he would tell you that he just sits there and calls action and the the dp and the crew do uh the heavy lifting um and he's 
right in the sense that television crews have so much continuity and directors are coming in to visit the set. Sure. It, you know, they, they, they're not making this thing week in, week out. And we do tend to forget it when we're writers who come up or we're directors who come up to set for, you know, the, the, the two weeks of prep and production on an episode, you feel like you've wrapped the movie by the end of it and you realize, oh, yeah, but everybody else here is going to work tomorrow. They, they're like, OK, see ya. We're going to go make the next one now. And so, you know, he's right in that sense, but he brings so much to it, it, not just in terms of like making the set a happy place, but also in terms of story and dialogue. But we have like, uh, uh, you know, Alexis Ostrander, who who just directed my last episode of the show and also did uh, What's So Funny About Truth and Justice. Yes. Um she just can really shoot a fight scene and she really thinks about the transitions and the visuals of the show and like how you can tell that story visually. And that's like a completely different perspective than, than Kevin brings to it. And Carl Seaton, who did uh, the, the big Lex Luthor episode house of L I, when I worked very closely with him and he got in there just in terms of the acting it was just like, well, you know, we're going to do some cool shots and we're going to do this, but like, let's get in and talk about the power dynamics. Like who has the power in this scene? And it, you know, is, is John Cryer winning this scene or is Melissa Benoist winning this scene? And, uh, it's very fun as a writer to get to go up and visit set while you're doing this and just see the ways, the different ways directors work. Absolutely. Framing and, and framing it accordingly for that kind of emotional scene. So I can appreciate that. That sounds great. Um, and yeah, Australia did a hell of a job. That's funny uh, in uh, prepping in this She's talk. So good. You know, I was going to say, in, ter- in terms of getting ready to talk to you today, those are the two episodes that I rewatched. I watched last night, but then I watched it a second time today and I watched uh, What's So Funny again. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh no, man. Great stuff. And again, truly, uh, the way that I think you and I became aware of each other as we transitioned to another subject is, uh, oh, yeah. Hey man, Justice League Fatal Five, great animated movie. Uh, Ooh. well done. Honestly, man. And, Thank you. and absolutely. And I'm, and I'm really, I, I liked the mentorship that the Trinity had for, uh, for the younger heroes, Jessica Cruz and McGann. And um, and certainly got Starboy, and again taking the uh, Lightning Saga uh, that Brad Meltzer and Jeff did such a great job on ten years ago. Yeah, about just about ten years ago. Yeah, so long now. But yeah, crazy. <laughs> I think of that as a new comic book still. I understand, dude. I understand. I always think of it as yeah, I did that on War Balloon not long ago. Oh, twelve years ago, <laughs> really? Yeah. You know, and it's like yeah. So uh, no, but I I loved the. Uh, I think you guys handled. Uh, Starboy's problems in a in a great way that I think was a teaching way, and it was different again from the way that uh, the way I, I I liked Rain Man Tom in the comics in that he seemed uh, without inhibition, and 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 that it was more like the, the, that he wasn't struggling with remembering, or and also it wasn't a burden. It really was just that his mind was free. And just, I loved how he would just kind of dreamily talk to Clark and call him Clark while he's Superman and stuff. And just be like, you know, God, Clark, it's great to see you. And man, have you had the Sloppy Joes here at the, at the home? It's been, they're fantastic. And he's really enjoying himself. And, and, you know, Clark's trying to get the information out of Tom. But that's the thing. It was a different vibe. And I, and I kind of liked uh, the tragedy uh, in Tom's story in Fatal Five. Yeah, we definitely, I, you know, I, I think that obviously that that run in the comics was uh, one of the big touch points for us as as we broke the story for it. Uh, and, and also the the Justice Society run that, that Jeff did with David Goyer and Dale Eaglesham. Sure. Uh, you know, Starman, uh, Tom Keller was a, a huge part Very of much. that story. It was that same that same take on the character, same costume, same kind of you know rambling, uh, uh, losing the thread, uninhibited voice for the character, yeah. and we sort of went for uh, you know a, a city on the edge of forever thing where we could uh, you know Bruce is a, is a big Trek fan, and so we sort of went for that because it gave you a little bit more drama in the scenes to, to know that he was fighting something, and it also made it seem. I think there's a, a kind of coded way we we show uh, uh, schizophrenia in in movies. Um, there's, there's sort of a, a twelve monkeys type of crazy that uh-huh. you hear in movies, and we didn't exactly want like we wanted an exciting man from the future story where we could we could have that kind of heightened sense of him. 
But we also wanted to make it clear that his frustrations were coming from knowing that he was, in fact, capable and knowing exactly what he was capable of and not being able to necessarily express it all the time and making it a surmountable obstacle for him instead of something that that we were viewing as debilitating. And that was really important to us to, to get those mental health issues in the movie as right as we could. That's cool. And I, th- I think, again, I think you guys, I'm always impressed by the sophistication of story writing that's going on in these animated DC films and they're accessible, but they don't, they don't, you know, talk down to kids and, you know, really ever since the original justice league cartoon of the 2000 or of 1999, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, I, I always point to one of my best friends who was a comic book reader when he was a kid. And, you know, when we were in college together, that's when Watchmen and dark Knight happened and everything. And um, I told him about the new Justice League show, and we'd watch it on on a Saturday night on Cartoon Network. And his wife would walk in and be like, "Why are you watching a cartoon?" And just watching him trying to explain, <laughs> like, "Look, you got to understand, like, the writing on this is incredible, and it really it's so is. good." And it was, it was, and and I could appreciate too that the times that they kind of flirted with, well, maybe we'll cancel it. I mean, you know, those those animated uh, shows for Cartoon Network are made for a Y seven audience. And yeah. I mean the, the the Green Lantern show not going going beyond a season is a great example of well yeah we liked it and yeah it was great writing but it didn't sell the toys and we need to sell the toys because that's kind of yeah, the purpose are, you know they are at some level yeah advertisements for for the merch yeah. and uh, and yeah so but I yeah that that Justice League show particularly Justice League Unlimited the 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 whole. That whole universe uh, means so much to me. They were cartoons that I grew up with. Sure. It is sort of unbelievable to me that I, I, I got a chance to play in that uh, sandbox at all. Um, and so uh, this is a, 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 a dream sort of project. And it, it's just kind of crazy um, to see it in that style and with these voice actors. Well, and also I really hope that you guys open the door for the possibility of getting a full cast reunion. And Susan's a buddy of mine. Susan Eisenberg is listeners now. Uh, the animated Amazon, as I like to call her, Wonder Woman. Uh, she, she's, and I had no idea that she was the one kind of spearheading. Hey, at, you know, I'm hearing it from the fans at every show I do. When are you guys going to do something? Okay, well, you guys need to organize and start talking to the powers that be. These are the people that need to hear you. And thank God for social media. This is one of the good things that social media is able to accomplish. And and that's, oh, yeah. and then what a great thing. And also to work with Bruce. And and really have it you know feel like a continuation of uh, the Justice League Unlimited series and then the original Justice League series and having and it look like that. I mean, I don't mind the new designs. I, I have no problem with that. No, they're great. The Barossa designs are are great too. Uh, it just happens that you know my Batman was the Batman the animated series sure. design, and that, those <laughs> designs are seared into my brain at this point, and so they they just they mean something to me. Um, and so, yeah, it was crazy. Uh, it's also the last, um, uh, because he retired, uh, right after we did this movie, the last, uh, Alan Burnett, Bruce Tim collaboration. Oh, uh, in- wow. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the OG Batman, the animated series guys together on this movie where Kevin Conroy is playing a Batman that's drawn in the Bruce Tim style and, uh, saying words that I wrote. It's unbelievable. Um, but yeah, but Alan called me kind of cold i had done a, a few short like justice league action episodes okay that were yeah two minutes long yeah the only thing i had done in this I, you know I, I had done them before supergirl right uh gone on to supergirl but i guess alan really liked you know it was me and and uh uh paul dini and john callan and a few others had done uh just these little shorts um and they're fun but I I don't know that you would watch these shorts and necessarily go okay that guy can do one of our PG thirteen uh, seventy five minute Justice League movie. we're gonna trust that guy with it um, because they were truly like little two minute uh, one was the Plastic Man of Steel and it was <laughs> Plastic Man has to pretend to be Superman long enough to uh, uh, you know fool Lois because Lois has begun to suspect that Clark is Superman they were like really. Fun, silly, uh, you know, one was Space Cabby teaching Stargirl to drive his space because she had her driving test the next day. <laughs> and so he's teaching her how to drive in a space cab and they see a space ATM getting robbed and have to go spoil it. So they were like 
they're fun, but like it was, but I got to work closely with Alan on them, but it is, it is so funny to me that Alan was like, I really liked your two minute shorts. And so please come do this, this movie. Well, but I got to say, man, uh, not to justice league action in general, because you'd either have like this, the, the seven minute uh, long story or the two minute short stories. It seemed, um, yeah. they were great. And honestly, I was worried because I'm like, well, that's not a lot of time. How are you guys going to pack any sort of story in there? Yep. And you guys managed to do it every time. Uh, it was there is a, it was great. That is one thing that that animation teaches you very quickly, and that uh, animation writers are really good at. Um, not necessarily counting myself as one who's good at it, but the the brevity in those scenes and and packing a lot into a single scene and making every line count because you know you don't have a lot of screen time sure. is a, a, a skill that, that you can lose doing live action for too long um, because you, you, you have the room in live action to let stuff breathe. Sometimes it's good and sometimes you're like, oh, I should have been more efficient there. Well, and also with the animation too, I know uh, I've heard that one of the reasons why uh, the heavy metal full-length movie are the different vignettes and one of the they, they said one of the strengths of having one of the, the different styles of animation is, you know, your eyes get tired watching the same animation uh, mm. for, for a long period of time too. So that's interesting. Yeah, I thought so too. And I mean, I, I wonder if that was uh, figuring in Alan's mind at all again, that you're already thinking about brevity and, and getting to the point of a scene and, and, and that kind of discipline. It's just like um, when I hear about the older writers of comics and how they really made their bones on five and eight page stories, you know, especially Bronze Age guys, you know, when they were yeah. when they were writing for anthologies and stuff like that, and that really taught them to understand when they did graduate to a twenty or twenty four page script, you know, how to how to you know write it and, and and get get the point across as quickly as possible. So some of those stories are my favorite stories too, right? Totally. Like I, the thing that really, I you know, I, I was. I read some Spider-Man and X-Men growing up, but mostly I was a DC guy. And that mostly – the love for it came when you'd hit a Christmas special uh, and you know, you'd have these little five or eight-page stories or in the annuals where you just you know have little cameos from the other heroes. And hey, Hal Jordan shows up in this Green Arrow comic and you know, you're like, OK, I get something out of this. Uh, sure. And you can quickly understand – the relationships between these people or, you know, if it's a legacy character, you can see the original version of this character for just long enough that you get a taste. And then you're like, OK, I want to now go look into that hero's comics. Um, and I, I love those stories, man. No, I hear you, man. For me in the Superman uh, universe, there were a couple that were uh, six page and eight page story backup stories. And one was The Private Life of Clark Kent, where it really was just a Clark Kent story. Bob Rosakis was one of the guys who would always write those. Yeah. And then the other one was, and honestly, I uh, I felt like the new 52 Superman was almost a throwback to what they called Superman the in-between years, where he was in college. And, uh, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, too too old to be Superboy, but not quite Superman yet. And that's what they were called, those the in-between years. Ones. Yeah. There's there's one uh, in, in, speaking of short comic stories there's one in action comics 800 one of the the anniversary sure. issue that has him that has clark in paris and it's like his sort of like you know finding himself years that they did super well in uh uh birthright too in the mark wade oh, uh, birth yes, yes. Uh, so. that just like covers uh that's just a, like an era that i want to see more of i agree and you know that's really what the, the i thought the final yeah. couple seasons of smallville became like certainly, yeah. you know, nine and ten definitely, and that was okay. It was fine. It was fun to watch um, for what it was. Again, it's something different. But I, I you know, on the ninth season, what's that? that? Was my that was my first Hollywood job? Was Smallville season nine? I was an intern in the writers' room. I wow. got people. Co- I got people coffee. I got to meet Jeff Johns. Uh, I got to. I got a little Daily Planet keychain from it. it ah. uh, is- the thing that solidified, hey, you do want to be a TV writer because uh, it seems fun to. Uh, talk about this stuff all day and uh, and do it professionally. And that open doors for you, obviously. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. So it's all. It's basically I've been a company man, is what I'm here to say. <laughs> it's it's been it's been DC Comics, and uh, I I hope they're listening. That's excellent, man. No, that's great. And truly, uh, and by the way, when when Justice League Action had Space Gabby, you had me at hello because again, I I used to get those hundred page spectaculars where they'd fill them with. Uh, 
you know, sci-fi eight and eleven page filler stories. And so yeah, I read a ton of Space Cabbie well before our Justice League action. And I'm like, I can't believe Space Cabbie's back because that was always great designs. I love the design of his cab. And oh my God, yeah. just just vintage DC sci fi at its best. And which is a it's totally so different ridiculous. brain than Marvel's yeah. sci fi, but but still charming in its own way. It's so different. It's him and like Detective Chimp are the ones for me where I'm like, this is so magical and so, so silly. And I love it. So, and we, it was Patton Oswalt with Space Cabby. That's, uh, oh, that's a good game. I didn't realize that. That's fantastic. Oh my God. I'm sure he was three. He's like my age. I'm sure he was thrilled to be Space Cabby. That's fantastic. I'm sure. I never, I, I never had any interaction with him on it. I wonder if he, yeah, I wonder if he's talked about whether or not he had read. The character before. I was really bummed that Justice League action didn't get. I mean, you guys made a ton. I mean, I know you made like fifty some. Well, at least like there was a bunch. Of, like, yeah, it was mostly just a fan of it until I got to write those little webisodes and uh, and then you know had the show come back for a further season. I'm sure I I would have been thrilled to work on it, but um, but yeah, it just sort of. Uh, they started to split up the episodes on Cartoon Network, so instead of getting two 11-minute uh, episodes back-to-back to make a full kind of half hour, they were splitting them up, and so – which is okay. There wasn't continuity between the episodes or anything, so yeah. you didn't feel like you were missing anything, but you know, it is a little hard to even remember that the show is on – on when uh, sometimes on certain cable packages, it wouldn't even show up in the time slot as Justice League action. It would show up as whatever the thing after yeah. it or before oh, was. Oh, no, so. I, I had that problem. I, I mean, in Chicago, they'd air at like 6 in the morning from 6 till 6.15. And yeah. it's like, and what? <laughs> you know, and I, yeah, it was tough. It's hard to record it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. No, it was tough. It was tough. Are they running on DC Universe, so the, the streaming channel? I believe they are, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I got to dig that out. I got to. Mm-hmm. I got to go see. I'm too busy watching Doom Patrol and uh, and Young Justice, feel, of course. I feel like I heard they were on there, but I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah. They're 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 a lot of fun for for listeners who who have not seen it because they are they go down smooth. Well, and again, hundred percent. And um, I had a chance to talk to Paul Dini about it, and I've met John Callen, and I keep meaning to make time to get him on the show. Uh, because yeah, I think uh, they were they were they were a lot of fun and really, like I said, when it was announced and that it's only going to be a fifteen minute show, it was like, oh, is that or like oh, that they were going to be eleven minute stories? It's like, well, damn man, I mean they did a great job on Justice League and they only had eighteen minutes or twenty minutes for a half hour show. How's it going to be when you only have half of that? That's that seems rough. But then uh, you know, again, I was proven wrong. I think a lot of those uh, nine minute or eleven minute episodes were great. Yeah, they did a great job. And the um, and it was a fun, the fun stuff that was a, a, allowed to be fun. Yeah, um, yeah, it was, it, exactly. It was still, I mean, it lived up to the name Justice League Action, but it definitely had a good sense of humor about it as well. And not in the extreme, and I love Teen Titans Go, that's that's fine. But um, it was just nice to see that um, it was you know, not a little more serious, but just a different kind of comedy. I am, uh, I, I, it is such an embarrassment of riches that we have everything from... Teen Titans Go happening right now to, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, shows for shows for seven year olds, the type of DC Comics entertainment, you know, through these Berlantiverse shows to, uh, uh, you know, Doom Patrol where uh, Flex Mentallo uh, flexes the wrong muscle and there is a mass orgasm on a street in in the street also uh, finishes. It's it's. So insane to me that we get all the way to Doom Patrol in terms of superhero storytelling right now. That uh, uh, what a time to be alive! But this is this is the difference. Not and I mean I hate I hate to pick on Star Trek, but seriously, uh, the difference between understanding what the franchise is, how it works, and hiring uh, writers that get it. And it's interesting, as you said, that on Supergirl, you're the comic book guy. Um, Whoever they've got on their writing staff, I give them credit because again, and I know Berlanti clearly and Jeff are are obviously massive fans of uh, mm-hmm. you know the original source material, so they they know what they're dealing with. Mark Guggenheim, a good friend, he you know another another good keeper of the flame, and then a guy that understood where the source material was coming from. I you know so yeah, I, I don't know. It's it, but again, in contrast, you do see franchises doing it wrong, um, and it will be interesting to see as they explore going into Y7 areas with, like, a Nickelodeon Star Trek kids show 
And uh, the, the the idea of the Rick and Morty uh, writers coming up with uh, Lower Decks and being a, a, a comedy. that uh, Yeah, they have a, a spectrum of shows, too. Yeah, to choose. So, yeah, so I, I think that'll be a really interesting time for Trek. Um, but yeah, it's uh, you just have to, like, dive in and embrace it because it's like – it, the the crazier it is that it used to be that that television in particular but the movies as well would shy away from it like gone are the days of the x-men's costumes are black leather and we actually make a crack about yellow spandex in that first x-men yeah. movie <laughs> and like you know spider-man in rides has a moment where he rides a unicorn in endgame um <laughs> that's in, or not a unicorn, a, a Pegasus. Uh, yeah, a winged, uh, winged and, horse. And, yeah, yeah. That's fine. Right? So uh, there's a winged horse, and Spider-Man, you know, <laughs> in an effort to evade Thanos while carrying the Infinity Gauntlet, is not like I saw this photo floating around Twitter, and I was like, yeah, that is insane. Like, try going back to the days of like the Raimi Spider-Man or the or, or you know the the Burton Batman, and telling somebody about that visual is is uh is so strange and i think the more you embrace it the more success you have um it also means you know occasionally you have moments like we did on fatal five where we're doing legion of superhero stuff and i know i know i'm gonna catch shit for it uh on twitter where uh you know legion of superheroes fan accounts will be like why is his name thomas calor in the movie instead of tom he's always been tom in the comics oh, and you know, there's stuff like that where it's like we did think about it. We swear we just thought Thomas would sound cooler in Kevin Conroy's, you know, deep voice that it had a little more gravitas to it. And it made him more uh, uh, vulnerable in some way and, and a little bit more relatable to us. And also, hey, Tom York, Radiohead guy, his name's Thomas. Like, give it a rest. Uh, <laughs> I understand. But I but I do get it because sure. that's our bread and butter, right? Is sure. the debates about, you know, would this person win in a fight or would this person? And like, yeah. I think that's sort of the fun of it. And I don't want to take that away from people, but uh, I, I do wish that people knew uh, how much we slave away uh, when we're making these things, just agonizing over any choice that deviates from the comics, because, you know, especially in the animation world, it's, it's made by fans and they're all going, okay, we're calling it a time sphere for this one moment because it works better. We all know uh, we should have said bubble, but listen. It's, <laughs> or like Saturn Girl has kind of a psionic shield in this moment. And yeah, she can't really do that in the comics. Uh, but it, we needed a visual here. Like there's some there's some things that you do to make the movie work. And we're all like agonizing about them, um, knowing that uh, that somewhere there's a a, a debate that's going to happen about this <laughs> well the good news is you did have enough real estate <laughs> to give enough nods to the legion and uh, for, man the, you know seeing all the statues was great and then yeah. I mean, just that heart tugging end hey man i'll tell you i i mean obviously end game and uh and your funeral uh familiar territory in both cases both real solid <laughs> moments and i give you credit because i think it's tougher to get that kind of emotion from uh from an animated film but uh, oh god, when when the Legion show up at the end of the movie and everything, and I, I think it's been out long enough that if you haven't seen it by now, I mean I won't I, I don't I won't have to full yeah. full Spoil, spoilers. You know, something sad happens, and you should something watch it. Uh, <laughs> hit pause, go watch it, uh, come back. Okay, and we're back. Exactly. No, that was great, man. And truly, I wasn't expecting it, and then just to see them come out of the time portal and and, and just you know collect the body and then go away. It's like, ah, oh, that's, there crazy. was a brief moment where, where we were going to have a uh, Saturn girl come up to uh, Superman um, as if they've met before sure. and have Superman go, like, Hey, have we met and have like Brainiac five throw like a glance to her and have her go like, Oh, uh, hi, nice to meet you, Mr. Superman, sir. Oh, that's uh, fun. And just sort of imply that there are some uh, Legion adventures that Clark has had that he just doesn't remember um, for mind white purposes. And I guess uh, in in the DC animated universe that did happen, right? They did meet. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize young... that. Well, yeah, they. I remember in the uh, the old uh, Superman series of the nineties the, that they went back in time and they and they met him yeah. and everything. Yeah, I didn't remember the mind. mind wipe. I didn't remember the mind wipe. That's fantastic because because truly, again, I love in Lightning Saga when. Superman's just trying to explain. He's like, 
oh yeah, those are my friends. I used to be able to fly with them. And it's true. Yeah. It's that basic of like, wow, I'm a young man and, and here's these other young people that like know what I'm going through. And I just, I, I well, again, that's why I adored the Legion because it was that kind of, even though they're a thousand years ahead and everything, that things are still the same. And they just had this love for for Superboy and and vice versa, and right through from the from the original Kurt Swan Otto Bender stories, right through the Paul Levitz, you know, uh, Return of Dark Side, and all all the great uh, stories of uh, of the eighties. Five years later, and the like, yep. all that stuff. I love the that Legion. Was the main thing we wanted to capture from the Legion was we knew we didn't have a lot of time sure. with the thirty first century, and we you know we didn't have a, we could show you pieces of the clubhouse and stuff, but. <laughs> The the main thing we wanted to give you was that the the thing the magic of it to me at least is, you know, comics are so often about uh you know you have characters called Doomsday it's all a apoc- you know a planet called Apocalypse you have like all of these very nightmarish visions of the future you know Batman six 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 and like it, it always seems to turn out bad but there is always in the end the promise of at least by the 31st century, there's one way that this turns out all right and we sort of get the Jetsons future and the kids are all right and, uh, you know, you can believe in that and there's something to strive for. And there's something magical about knowing that's there and having that sense of this was the Justice League's legacy. This is what they passed on is is the hope that there could be a better world. And knowing that Starboy was going to get to go back in time and meet his heroes, we, we sort of got to play with that as a theme a little bit for the movie. And that was, uh, it was more, let's, let's capture the feeling of the Legion than it was any one particular story. And then, like you said, having, uh, Megan and McGann and, uh, and Jessica Cruz in there too. And I thought that was a great platform to introduce them to a wider audience. Maybe people who didn't watch young justice and didn't know about, uh, McGann's uh, role in that, but Jessica as well. And, and, and I know, uh, Susan, uh, talked about, being able to, you know, for for her Wonder Woman to be able to mentor uh, Jessica Cruz was really, you know, a neat facet for her to play. Yeah, that's the whole the the whole uh, thing that I set out to do when I first, you know, I, I Alan called me and said, hey, you know, hi, it's Alan Burnett. Uh, you want to do one of these uh, VOD, you know, the the DTVs we do? And I went, yes. And he goes, do, do you want to know what it is? And I was like, I don't need to, but uh, you'll tell me when I show up, right? And they, I showed up, and they said it's the Justice League versus the Fatal Five. That's that's what they had. And I, I showed up to a meeting with Alan and Bruce Tim, and uh, I was trying not to freak out about you know meeting and getting to work with Bruce. Um, and they were truly like, the sky is the limit. The 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 entire DC universe is available to you. You're gonna have the Trinity in this movie, uh, just you know because we do, and we tend to want Batman and Wonder Woman and Superman in our movies. And I was like, oh, I would have wanted them anyway. Um, and then they're like, but other than that, like, you know, pick your Justice League roster and, you know, you do what you want with the story. And so we started thinking backwards. We, I knew that if the Fatal Five was going to threaten the Justice League, it either meant the Justice League was traveling forward or they were traveling backward. And we sort of wanted to live in the real world a little bit. So, OK, that means traveling backward. And if you've got villains from the future, it would be nice to have some Legion presence in the movie. And so we were like, let's do the version of Starboy who comes back and doesn't have his medication. And that opened up the world of, you know, people with with problems and, and you know, neuroatypical people. Yeah. And I am such a fan of the Jessica Cruz character and particularly the the new comics, the the Green Lanterns comic. Yeah. Uh, it was going until recently with uh, Jessica and Simon Baz mm-hmm. uh, that Sam Humphries did. Absolutely. Uh, and, I, you know, I could see that that was striking a chord with people. It was striking a chord uh, with me. It was handling her anxiety in a, you know, in a really cool way. Um, and we wanted to sort of touch on that. And uh, Jim Krieg uh, and I, uh, he's one of the producers and one of the co-writers on the movie. Yeah. Um, we brought up I, I can't remember which of us brought it up first, but we brought up uh David and Lisa, the old uh the old Frank Perry movie. Um and uh it, you know, it's sort of a, a story about two uh people uh in a uh, mental hospital who kind of find each other and heal each other in these little uh, small ways. Okay. And once once we sort of had that central relationship, okay, this is gonna be uh Starboy and Jessica Cruz movie that was it. Like we realized, okay, these are people who are outsiders to the justice league in some way, Jessica, who has to, 
you know, learn what she's capable of. Starboy who has to remember what he's capable of. Let's fill out the Justice League with somebody else who can represent that too. And that meant, hey, let's let's try Miss Martian and let's just have some new blood coming into the Justice League. Because that will feel the most like a sequel to Justice League Unlimited. That will feel the most like absolutely we're moving forward with the story instead of just t- looking backward. Well, and you're right. That I forgot about that. That was a big aspect of uh, Justice League Unlimited was introducing other characters and kind of a mentorship going on. Yeah. So, no, I think you're right about that completely. And it did move the story forward. And I'm I, and I love the nods to the series when it was asked, "Where's Flash? Where's whatever?" You know, and then then you know a, you know where's John? Where's John Stewart? Yeah, mention Hawkgirl a little bit, yes. and yeah, we we there's a little bit. Um, and you know, we just felt like that's. If the show had continued, I feel like that's what they would have done. It wouldn't right. have been okay. Let's let's just do nostalgia. Let's they would have been pushing things forward because they always were, and they never really stopped to explain what you were seeing necessarily. Just like Unlimited starts, and it's just like uh, Star City, and you're just like, okay, here's this guy. He's Green Arrow, and we're not going to tell you much about him or show you an origin or anything. He's just around. And we're going to throw you into all these new characters, Huntress and The Question. And, yeah, uh, Limited was... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's uh, we, we just tried to do that. Some of the best compliments I get on it are the ones that are like, I, I mean this with all the love in my heart. It feels like a lost episode of Justice League sure. Unlimited that was found. And I'm like, that is the highest possible compliment for this because it's such a great show. That's great, man. No, no, that's uh, honestly. Um, and and really, again, uh, pointing out, and I really hope the movie is doing well. It seems like it is from a social media standpoint. But I, me I mean, you know, yeah. And the fact, too, that it's already streaming now in DC Universe. So uh, it's readily avail- available for people who haven't seen it yet. It's great. And, uh, uh, yeah, man, no, you guys absolutely captured the feel. And uh, so did Alan give you notes and everything on scripts and, you know, and, and oh, Bruce and, you know? He did his little pass and Bruce um, Bruce has is this tremendous collaborator and he was so excited about it. And, you know, he's been – I think he could have let it be a mystery. You know, is this is this canon in the DCAU? Is this like there, that was the biggest question we got sure, over and over sure. leading up to the movie's release? And he, you know, he came out on the WonderCon panel where we premiered the movie right after we premiered the movie and just said uh, it's canon. Uh, and I, I really, you know, obviously your mileage may vary and you can choose what to exclude from your head canon. But to me, I really like this one and uh, I think it's canon. And I thought that was incredibly nice of him to do and. During the process, he you know he gives he gives great notes. He gives blunt notes. He gives great notes. He gives the notes of a man who's been doing this for a very long time, um, and he was the reason for the Fatal Five because he didn't want the Act Three sort of battle to devolve into you know we're fighting faceless parademons or we're fighting minions. Um, he wanted bad guys with a skill set to match the Justice League who could kind of give them a run for their money. And sure. so that was a, that was a, a, a Bruce mandate from the very beginning. Um, and so, yeah, he's just – he's great at all that. I think he threw in some lines of dialogue. He's our Two-Face in the movie. He's the voice of Two-Face. Oh, hilarious. In, uh, that little cameo where he does his best uh, Richard Mall impression yeah. and does uh, <laughs> Two-Face. <laughs> he did sound like Richard Mall. That was very good. I had no idea. That's insane. Yeah. I assumed it was Richard Mall. That was, that's wonderful. Too funny. Yeah. But again, you're right, man. And that's the thing. Tim and Burnett and those guys, it's interesting to hear that, that you know, this was Alan Swan song because, yeah, for 20 years, for 20 plus, he, no, 30 years. Jesus. Going, yeah. going back to the original he, animated the series. The keepers of this. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the thing. These are the guys that have been the keepers of these of this universe and these stories. And, man, I'll, uh, you know, the one episode that I just adored was uh, season four of Justice League, that Batman Beyond episode. They just tied oh everything Apple. together. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, I mean, that's the kind of, again, this is why my, my buddy with his wife's like, you don't understand how good the writing is. This you is should just see, just see Epilogue, but also don't watch Epilogue first. It won't mean anything to you yet. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, I hope that, uh, I, I'm sure you'd be interested in doing another uh, DC animated uh, feature. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I would love to. I'm with Susan on this. I know nothing more than anybody at home does about how this movie is selling or about uh, any plans or not plans for a, a Justice League reunion, hashtag JL reunion. Uh, but uh, 
but I do, you know, I, I'm here for it uh, as as a fan, as a as a writer, if they want me, as a person who will cheerlead uh, for this, uh, like Susan has been, um, because she's the greatest. Um, because I am, you know, it, uh, uh, a couple people have pointed out to me, uh, John Callan, and 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 just throughout this process, uh, other people, my my fiance for one, um, have pointed out to me that like. Yeah, you did a Justice League story that was all about Starboy getting to meet his heroes where he used to play with the Justice League playset. Uh, the, the, he used to have it in the Justice League or in the Legion of Superheroes clubhouse. And you've got Miss Martian, uh, who has the stern taskmaster Batman as her mentor in the movie. And you've got Jessica, who is just overwhelmed by how badass Wonder Woman is. And you just you wrote a movie about uh you being really scared to write this movie didn't you and i was like oh you know in hindsight maybe i did like i i truly like it and and i i think at some point jim started saying yeah bruce bruce tim is our batman he's the one we're just we're just trying to get him to approve of us man that makes sense it really does make sense believe me and i and having having met bruce and on a couple of press junkets and stuff like that it's uh, the best. he takes it seriously in the best possible way and I, he is the best. And yeah, yeah, I can I can understand that absolutely, man. No, it's 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 an amazing animation achievement. It absolutely was a game changer from the start of the animated series to what you guys are doing today. And uh, the again the 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 flexibility of these characters to be able to tell different animated stories. I'm looking forward to the new slate of uh, DC shorts that they've announced. Uh, yes, the, they're doing those again. Yeah, which, yeah which and that you. I'm not sure that they've announced all of them, but uh, but there's there's some that I think uh, you in particular will like of those uh, showcase shorts. Well, I so. know I know Adam Strange, and I know um, now I'm blanking on uh, some of the others. I know they announced five. And Sergeant Rock, of course, I'm excited about that. Yep, yep. My my favorite of the ones they have done in the past. I like the Green Arrow and the uh, the Spectre or the uh, Jonah Hex ones, but it was yeah the Spectre actually. Uh, yeah, I like that one quite a bit. Oh my god, it was incredible. And I man, I'm, and they did a yeah. really long Shazam one too. Oh yeah, that's right for the 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 Shazam like Black Adam. Yeah, yeah, it was with with Superman it, the, that crossover. And I always forget yeah. that was only a half hour, but yeah, it was pretty much based on uh, John Winnick's uh, story of how Superman and Captain Marvel first meet. And uh, yeah. sorry, he's still Captain Marvel to me. I understand. I, it's very very difficult for me to say Shazam. Shazam. Yeah, I know. <laughs> very hard. I'm with you, man. It's too funny. I uh, I'm thrilled and I'm glad the I'm glad the movie was as good as it was. I'm sorry that it didn't do. I I don't know what the verdict will be in terms of will we get another Shazam movie or not. Um, and it's it's a shame if we don't because it was a great movie. Maybe it will find its audience uh, on on you know cable and DVD when it when it does come out in the next few weeks and months. I bet it will. That that climax was so good. Yeah. And when they all grab hold of the 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 staff, I mean, it's just. Yeah, everything after that is just pure, like, somebody melted down joy and is putting it into your eyes. It's so good. Well, and I know Jeff has been, like, trying to develop that for, for over a decade, so I'm glad it finally happened and everything. And I know that was one of his babies, and, and you know, yeah, it's uh, it's good. And, I and, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. Hey, uh, you know, last week they announced Robert Pattinson is likely the uh, next Batman for Matt Reeves. I I am optimistic uh, until I see otherwise. I mean, is have you seen uh, the movie Good Time? No, I keep hearing he was great, and I got so I'm cool with him being uh, Bruce Wayne. Yeah, the, the Safety brothers directed this movie called Good Time, which is you know one of those. It's a very like uh, almost Scorsese like uh, one night uh, in New York sort of oh, like uh, after story. Hours. Sure, sure. Yes, wow. it's a very kind of after hours Ooh. movie. Well, then I do want to see it. <laughs> it is a relentless, like sometimes funny, sometimes harrowing, like cool. terrible, no good, very bad night in New York. And Robert Pattinson, I am certain, can do anything. After you watch this movie, he is he is so intense in it, and uh, he's the perfect uh, man, I'm assuming he's the he's the focal he, point. Yeah, and he's okay. just trying to help out his his brother, and it is it is a it is a very very good movie. But more than that, it is a showcase for Robert Pattinson as a guy who should be in all the movies. That sounds great. No, I'm, I'm, Hey man, as I pointed out last week, I interviewed uh, Robert Wall, uh, who was in Batman 89. And we talked about the grief Michael Keaton guy, but on the opposite yeah. end of the spectrum, I remember distinctly, we all saying George Clooney as Batman sounds like a great idea. 
And again, and, right. yeah, and yeah, he yeah. always falls on the sword for the failures of Batman and Robin. But the reality is, it's like, no, man, they, they let you down with a lousy script. And also, I even like cut slack to Schumacher because I heard him on Fresh Air years later. And it's like, yeah, they would walk in and tell him, you know, bring in a toy and go, we need a scene that features something like this. And it's like, okay. you know, it stopped being a movie and it was just kind of a marketing thing. And yeah, it just got, it, it just got ridiculous. And it's, it's like, yeah, no, it wasn't Clooney's fault. But again, it was like, oh, Clooney is Batman. That, that should work out. What could go wrong? So, so <laughs> yeah, we know nothing until, yeah, we know nothing till we see the movie. And, and that's exactly. why I'm, I'm like, no, I could see Pattinson being a Bruce Wayne. Sure. Yep. I trust, uh, yeah, Cosmopolis uh, shows you he can be a great Bruce Wayne. I think Good Time shows you he can be a good Batman. And I, I think Matt Reeves is a good director. And, and you know, he did those Planet of the Apes movies that are, yeah. are very, very well done. Um, and so I, I have, like, really high hopes for it. So, uh, But I, 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 I'm also just, you know, anytime there's new Batman, you got to also go in knowing, okay, you're like – you don't know what you're going to get. You've had every conceivable type of Batman at this point, and so you can't go in with expectations, uh, you know, uh, about what kind of Batman you're going to totally. get. Totally, and the one thing I always say about Keaton that I loved was that idea that as Bruce Wayne, he was uncomfortable and that he really didn't yeah. know himself. I mean, and that's he was just always confused as Bruce Wayne, and it seemed like genuine, and it wasn't a Clark Kent meekness. It was. It really was a... All right, I, yeah, all right, I'm supposed to be the rich guy now. What, what am I supposed to do? And he, that he's yeah. just more comfortable being Batman. And I and I love that. I thought that was great. The kind of weird date with Vicky Vale where they're sitting yes. at opposite end of the table and he's just like, you know, tell you the truth, I'm not sure I've ever been in this room. Like, he's just so offbeat in, in such a cool way. And I just, like, I, I tend to gravitate toward the, like, the Denny O'Neill uh, or the the, the Englehart sort of Batman, okay. where you've got like uh, he he can he can laugh and he can yes. he can he's a human and yes. Batman is almost more of a coping mechanism for a mostly healthy man as opposed to like a, a Frank Miller Terrific. you know sort of a yeah. more messed up Batman. Uh, I have a feeling that the Robert Pattinson version of Batman might be a little weirder and a little bit more in the Keaton vein, and I I do feel like I'm. I'm ready for it. It doesn't tend to be my favorite Batman in the comics, but I somehow I'm ready for it in the movie. Like I'm ready for a truly a weirdo Batman. I'm with you, man. No, and it's funny. I had Englehart on when he came back for his uh, third uh, story, his second and third stories, Dark Detective and Dark Detective Two, yeah. which were continuations of the Laughing Fish story. And man, he would get mm-hmm. grief on a line of, "Well, Batman wouldn't do that." And it's like, uh, sorry, this guy in Marshall Rogers. They know what they're doing with Batman. I, I'm sorry, yeah, fan. Yeah, shut the fuck up. <laughs> and this is also like that. I mean, maybe it's also maybe it comes right back to Bruce Tim and Alan Burnett again because I, that is so much of what the animated series Batman is is their runs and the Denny O'Neill stuff and, and uh, Neil Adams stuff. And so I feel like maybe it's just that's the reason is that he's a he's an ever so slightly more well adjusted Batman. Yes. Uh, in that. <laughs> No, I'm with you, I, and I agree with that. I um, and another uh, pair pair that were like that were Alan Davis and Mike Barr when they were doing Detective. Yeah, yeah. And I I always love pointing out in Detective 400 where uh, Sherlock Holmes makes the appearance, and he's you know 120 year old Sherlock Holmes at that point, and uh, he's got the pipe. And Batman, first of all, every time Sherlock Holmes is talking, Batman has this smile on his face, and it's a legitimate smile. And then he tries to light his pipe, and he's like, "Oh, thanks, son. This is really for affectation. I, I don't smoke anymore." And, uh, and that was awesome. Right. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, it's Love. Bat- yeah. Batman and his hero. Of course, he's going to smile. So no, I. That's a- you know. You go ahead. Uh, you go ahead and talk. I, no, no, I was saying that's. I, I don't think I've read that one, and that is adorable. I like a cute Batman. I like a cute Batman moment. I like a gray a Batman with the gray ghost. Yes. Uh, just like so excited to meet this guy. Yes. You know. No man. Again, uh, that's the, the 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 various things that they introduced in the animated series were really fun and even um the new dimension to harvey and 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 the two-face yeah. and everything i mean it's no it was a, it really was a great great series that you know deserves the attention and re-examination and i love when people discover uh mask of the phantasm for that matter because uh oh. you know and, and and i'm hearing i don't know how much you can trust rumors but i'm hearing matt reeves might be leaning into elements of matt mask of the phantasm which i think is a great idea uh i mean it's it's the best, and it's a, a little uh, untouched right yeah. now. Uh, 
Like she really she shows up in epilogue for like two seconds, and other than that, I don't think she's made her way into the mainstream books or the. I think you're right. Uh, anything think else? You're, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, man. No, that's a good call. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. a couple of things like that. I forget that their version of Two Face is its own thing. Like you fully forget that, like, oh, they brought this whole new layer to Mister Freeze and to yes. uh, Two Face, yes. like all this different <laughs> psychological stuff to those. I was like so excited to get to do. Uh, to get to touch on Two Face a little bit, sure. like I wasn't sure that they would let me do it. You know, Bruce doesn't always like to go backward, um, but since we knew that uh, Starboy would end up in a, a hospital of some kind, well, let's use the most dramatic version, which is Arkham Asylum, and then we get your cameos in, and you can see a little Arkham riot. Um, and but we we got to do like a slightly cleaned up, less gothic Arkham that appeared to be actually kind of working for some of its patients, sure. and I. I I just want what's best for Harvey Dent, and I believe in Harvey Dent, and I, <laughs> I, I got to do a little bit of him uh, uh, ever so slightly incrementally getting better. Um, I think that was uh, – that was uh, just as a fan of that series was, was pretty rewarding. That's excellent, man. That's fantastic. You believe in Harvey Dent too. I like that a lot. <laughs> no, dude, hey, listen. It's, it's been a pleasure. I, I, uh, I don't know how much you can tell us of what's on the horizon for you. I uh, we're, we're we're figuring out what the next thing is going to be um, uh, for the listeners. By the way, I uh, TV contracts are three years, and so when I did my three seasons on Supergirl, uh, I, I could have come back for more. I definitely thought about coming back for more because I do love the world and I love the character, uh, and this is a, a, a kick-ass uh, cast and crew. Um, but I did kind of want to work on some stuff for myself and find some new projects, and I had some some new opportunities and so uh i i parted ways with supergirl um on on the best terms um but now we're we're kind of figuring out the next thing um and so uh i am doing kevin has talked about this before so i can say a little bit um there is no uh schedule for it um and we're we're still writing it right now uh but kevin smith uh and i are doing a comic book um with Perneal Orem, who just drew, uh, who's an excellent artist, who just drew his Hit Girl series. Uh, oh, sure, Raymond. absolutely. So yeah, we're yeah. doing we're doing that. Uh, some other some other comics projects uh, on the horizon, um, and then uh, some hopefully uh, exciting TV stuff that we can uh, talk about next time. Hey, man, absolutely, and that was well, you beat me to it because I was going to say, please, you're welcome back. And uh, honestly, I really appreciate. Uh, Guys like yourself that, uh, you know, uh, as much as you're going to do in the comic book world, uh, I'm always interested in, in how the television world works, especially in today's environment where streaming is part of the picture and all these different things are being developed and um, how they're handled. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a fascinating time. And also, I know that you guys are on a bit of a roller coaster night right now as far as the Writers Guild goes. Uh, and, yes. and I know that's kind of in, in flux and my other screenwriter friends have, have told me about uh, the adventures that uh, unfortunately you guys are having to deal with right now. I felt for you guys 10 years ago during the writer's strike when Heroes was uh, in its second season and I was talking to Jeff Lobo and he was on the picket line and the yeah. like. Yeah. So uh, no, thanks man because honestly I, I know the listeners too uh, are really interested in how this stuff works and how it's written and how it's made and, and again it's great to have people like yourself that uh, get the original source material and only want to tell good stories. Everybody always wants to tell good stories. Even the people who make lousy stories are trying to tell good stories. But but it's nice that uh, the people that get it and are given the opportunity to give us more entertainment. So thanks for your body of work, like, man. Yeah, I feel like it's blurring more and more, right? Like, oh, absolutely. It feels like the early- the early days of of UFC, it was okay. Here's a here's a Hoist Gracie who does Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and here's this guy who kickboxes, and here's this guy who's you know just has this one specialty. And as the you know as it went on, now everybody is a mixed martial artist, and I feel like there are more and more people who kind of uh, uh, you know day walkers, and they can uh, float between. The- you know, the medium of, of, you know, they do television, they do comics and, you know, the, the Joe Henderson's of the world Absolutely. and, you know, you've had a, had a him on the show. So, yeah, Joe's, um, Joe's another friend and he's, uh, he's going to be coming on word balloon in the, the days ahead as well. So yeah, man, no, that's you, uh, yeah, you never want to be a tourist in, in comics or, uh, in TV or animation or any of these things you want to, 
do it because you love it and and uh, because you you want to be there and you want to tell great stories in whatever medium suits them best. Well, and it's a great time um, right now where where you've got a receptive mass audience that is is really excited about this stuff, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the next evolution in superhero hero television will be because I also think and and again this is me saying this um, I don't want it to be confused with it you're that I'm quoting you but <laughs> but no I think it's a good idea to kind of get out of the Berlanti verse because I don't know how much more time they have left uh, before it starts feeling you know like uh, formulaic you know what I mean and I and I uh, mostly I, I blame that on the burden of of and again, this is me saying this. If you want to comment, you're welcome to. But I think the burden of 20 plus episodes a season, and you see what cable and, and streaming are able to do with 13, and you know a lot of bottle episodes can be frustrating for an audience who it's like, all right, just get to the big bad. We know eventually, you know, it's going to be the Flash against Zoom. Uh, we don't need these four episodes leading up to it that have nothing to do with that. Get to the goddamn fight. And I said, you I'm, know, so that's me. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm very I'm very glad that I got to work on a kind of classic network TV show sure. model because that those are the shows that I wanted to be a part of. Those are the shows that I loved, you know, sure. growing up. Sure. And so, you know, I, I'm glad I have uh, uh, that that classic template um, on the resume and that I had that experience doing it. It's a lot. It's a lot of it's a lot of episodes creatively. It's a lot of episodes uh, uh, physically. Cre- you know, breaking any story is hard. Breaking twenty two of them is is very difficult, especially if you are trying to serialize your show a little bit sure. um, and have some continuity between the episodes. Um, and so it's tough. It's a fun puzzle. Um, and you know, you it's. Uh, but it is a puzzle, <laughs> and you there are now outlets where where you don't have to play that game, um, where you can you know set your length of episodes or number of episodes to exactly what you need to tell your story, and so that's kind of a, a blessing uh, in its own right. Understood. No, it's an interesting time, and uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, that that means that uh, there are extremes, both positive and negative, during interesting times, and uh, we'll see how things shake out, but. Like I said, man, great body of work. Congratulations, Eric, and, and truly uh, come back, and uh, I'd love to hear uh, both what you've got coming as far as comics and, and television or film. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> there you go, neat stuff from Eric Carrasco. I've actually uh, fallen into an interesting little television writing jag of interviews, uh, both uh, what I've given you lately and also uh, coming up in the days ahead, uh, probably before May wraps up or into early June. But uh, you'll also hear a great conversation with our buddy Joe Henderson. The uh, great Lucifer television series is back with season four. It's the first Netflix original season. Of course, you can find the first three seasons there as well. And Lucifer, another great show that keeps getting better and better. And it's great to catch up with Joe. And Joe, also a comic book writer, his comic book Skyward with Lee Weeks, nominated for uh, an, an Eisner for Best New Series. How about that? Right out of the box, man. His debut uh, comic book gets a nice little nod, and rightfully so. Two great creators in Lee Weeks and uh, Joe Henderson. So uh, Joe's pretty proud of that, and I think really happy that uh, things went great for Lucifer, and they immediately got picked up by Netflix when Fox, uh, through their financial troubles, had to jettison the series. And Lucifer very quickly found a great international home in Netflix. Uh, What's it like having a Netflix show now? Joe tells us about it on the next Word Balloon. I think you'll enjoy it. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll be connecting, too, with uh, our brody Brian Edward Hill, who uh, continues to do wonderful television and comic book work. We'll cover all that as well. So, uh, you know, we got, I'm, I'm really happy and uh, thrilled that Word Balloon has the opportunities that it does to uh, not only uh, talk about great comic books, but other uh, representations of comic books in television and film. So I think you're going to enjoy what's to come. But I wanted to give you a lot of episodes, especially this month. You know, it's anniversary month. And I know I've, uh, my output's been a lot. What can I say, man? I, I've been, uh, I've got the time and uh, the people all say yes. And we want to get them on in timely fashion. So you've been getting a lot more uh, word balloon than normal this month of May. And I hope you've enjoyed it. Today's episode's brought to you by uh, the League of Word Balloon listeners, again, via Patreon. Thank you, League, for your support. You help make it happen with your contributions and subscriptions to Word Balloon. Word Balloon is free, but if you want to help the cause, you can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon, or to get to my Patreon page, click on the ad 
uh, that's on the front page of WordBalloon.com. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Great stuff coming this year. Uh, again, starting on May 29th, next Wednesday, check out Killer Groove, a great Los Angeles crime story of the 70s from Ollie Masters and Owen Marin that uh, combines uh, crime and rock and roll. There's also Stronghold from Phil Hester and Ryan Kelly, Oberon from Ryan Parrott. There's Dark Red from Tim Seeley about a vampire living in rural America. Garth Ennis has great books like A Walk Through Hell and Out of the Blue, to name a few. And there's also Animosity from Marguerite Bennett and Dark Ark from Cullen Bunn and Juan Doe. All great Aftershock books that deserve your attention. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond coats on these books to order through your local shop at AftershockComics.com. Thanks again for listening. Thank you all for uh, supporting Word Balloon. And uh, really, man, as uh, we're winding down in May, uh, like I said, we still got one more week, so there's still going to be new stuff coming out next week here at WordBalloon.com. But really, thanks a lot. This is uh, our anniversary month. It's been 14 years with Word Balloon, and I am uh, thrilled with the direction the podcast has gone into and that you've all been on the journey with me. Uh, appreciating what I'm trying to do here and uh, the conversations we have with our guests that uh, really, I think, uh, make Word Balloon the special experience that it is. So I enjoy. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. Enjoy yourself. The summer is here and the time is right for dancing in the streets, as Martha and the Vandellas told us so many decades ago. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.